I know this is a very multicultural community here, and I am here uh, to bring you greetings from the Church of God in Paraguay. I'm traveling uh, with my family. Many of you we might know, but if this is the first time we connect, my name is Norberto Curley. I'm traveling with my beautiful wife, Nancy. Uh, I want to ask them to stand. Voy a pedir que se puedan poner de pie. Nancy and Dominic, seven-year-old, and Marcos in the back, and his fiance Paola. They just got engaged. Can you give him a, a hand just a few weeks ago? So you may be seated. My other daughter just got married a month ago, so it's been a mountain of celebrations in our home since, you know, before Christmas and all this season. I want to thank also Pastor David and this wonderful congregation for allowing us to be here and just to share these few minutes. Um, traveling, it, often people might see me on stage when I thank people or share, but uh, I couldn't do it without my family. I just want to honor my family that's traveling with me. Cuando viajamos es imposible hacer esto solo y quiero honrar esta mañana a mi familia, especialmente a mi esposa. Quiero que te pongas de pie más una vez, mi amor. Uh, can you stand one more time, Nancy? And, um, God has blessed me with Nancy. She is an incredible support. I couldn't do it without her. No lo podría hacer sin ti, mi amor. Gracias por todo tu apoyo. <laughs> I bring you greetings from the Church of God in Paraguay. Did you know that you have friends in eight cities in Paraguay? thanks to the partnership we, we have with St. Joe. Did you know that four of the five churches that you build with support and teams from this church are running at full capacity? That means two or 300 people gathering every Sunday in worship. Did you know that one of those churches just expanded to fit 700 people in their worship service? Did you know that Children of Promise, the ministry that many of you support, not only in other countries, but in Paraguay, uh, feeds over 100 kids and now spread into Argentina, thanks to your partnership and generosity. Did you know that the radio station you helped finish and build, where we were a part of for almost 10 years, is reaching half a million people for 25 years this year, blessing hundreds and thousands of people across denominations and impacting. It's the only Christian radio station in southern Paraguay. And did you know that 32 men and women pastors have graduated from the Bethel Bible Series, a two-year theological program that you support in the country of Paraguay? My wife leads that and connects with the pastors uh, every semester. I, I want to say a special thanks, and this might be a little personal, to to this congregation, but specifically to a few individuals. I don't know if they're in this building here. But uh, to Pastor Bob Moss, who back in 2001, 2002, said yes to an invitation to reach out to South America, and specifically Paraguay. And you have embraced our country and made a huge difference as you invested. I want to thank also Arden Bradley, who came down many times in work camps and led those. I want to thank Eric Fiskars. I'm not sure if he's here today, and his leadership to build these massive buildings. Most Paraguayans to this day talk about this tall guy who said, we're going to build a church in two weeks for 300 people. It was amazing. It made all the headlines. It, it's like people just drive by to see on Monday, and then on Tuesday, like, whoa, this is really, they're, they're, they're working. Um, I just want to thank those people and many of the pastors. I want to thank Pastor Bob Comfer, who has kind of kept the link with Paraguay. He's much more organized than I am. He's kept, you know, the papers in order, made notes, and kept me on track when we we're on, on work sites. Uh, thank you. I want to thank you, thank also Don and Beth Fiskars. Every time we've been in town, they've offered their basement, and it's like a, a little home away from home. I just want to thank you for your hospitality. First Church has made a great impact in our lives. I want to thank Pastor David one more time for your leadership in this congregation, how you're spreading out, how you're looking globally. My father 
turned 85 in December, and he sends you greetings. Maybe some of you have met him. Two years ago, he was diagnosed with uh, terminal prostate cancer, stage four. It had metastasized. And doctor said three more months. For after one year in bed, without not even being able to turn, he's now back on his feet. He's walking. He's preaching, and he's cancer-free. It's like God gave him a second season, and I know some of you have prayed. We serve a God who is holy, but is also a God of our bodies, and he can heal us and keep us around a little longer on this planet before we leave this beautiful earth. And I'm, just, I'm closing here. But so much good has come from this partnership. I'm here in the name of the church in Paraguay to say thank you. Thank you for investing in people, in buildings, in projects. Um, also, a motorcycle came from this church. I'm not going to say who, but I got a motorcycle. It's a Harley Davidson. We got a second motorcycle, a KLR Kawasaki. And there's three ways to take a motorcycle down to South America and Paraguay. You can either ship it by sea, you can fly it over the air, or you can ride it. Guess which one we're picking to get our motorcycles down to Paraguay? Yes, on January 25th, I ask for your prayers. My wife and Paola are flying back to Paraguay, and Marcos and I will ride the bike trip of our lifetime. So we're leaving Orlando, Florida. The bikes are in a warmer weather and then heading to Texas and then through Central America and South America. Our hope is to do it in about 45 days. Marcos just graduated from uh, college and he's getting ready to go into the workforce and we're just excited to have some father-son time to minister to the churches of God along the way and to hear from God what's next for the country of Paraguay. So I, I treasure your prayers. We have outside a table with some information about our vision for this trip. If you want to pick up a sheet, you're welcome to. And I just want to finish with the words that Pastor David last week shared about the rich young ruler. And it all comes down to surrendering, to giving ourselves to God. It's not about things we have, about money, about accomplishment. It's about saying, Lord, here I am. Use me. And God has used you, has used this church. God bless you as we continue worshiping today. And thank you. In the name of the Church of God in Paraguay. Let me pray for you, bro. Let me, let's, let's pray for, uh, for our brother. Uh, we're, I, I th I'm thinking back, the very first, when I come 17 years ago, the very first missions trip I went on with this congregation was to Paraguay. And so, yeah, so it just, we've had a long history and just what would echo Pastor Moss's vision to start. And now we've been able to continue that, that vision. And so God bless you. Let's, let's pray for uh, Alberto. Uh, and by the way, he does have a book that he, that he wrote and that's out in the lobby as well. I encourage you to pick that up. And we do have the little luncheon. Any of you are welcome to, to come today as we talk about a, a, a work trip, uh, a missions trip next year. So let's, let's pray. God, thank you for just the partnership for multiple decades that we've had with the Church of God in Paraguay. And God, I thank you that together we've been able to do wonderful kingdom things. And I pray, Father, you just continue the wonderful work uh, that my brother is, is involved in, engaged in. We thank you for the churches that are there. We thank you for the pastors that are there. We thank you for the, for the Children of Promise ministry. We thank you, Father, for Bethel Bible series and the training that's going on with pastors and, and leaders. God, there are so many wonderful things. The radio station, God, thank you, thank you, thank you for the privilege of being able to see broader than just here and be able to see beyond and to see what you could do as we partner together. I thank you for my brother. Pray, God, you would be with him and his son as they, as they travel on a crazy trip uh, on motorcycles down to South America. Protect them, bless them, and I pray that you would speak through that trip. God, thank you for my brother. Encourage him and his family. Thank you for the friendship that we have as brothers in Christ. We love you and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Bless you. Bless you. Well, take your Bible, if you... Thank you, Everett. Uh, take your Bible, if you would, and turn with me to Luke chapter 12. We're going to continue the series that we got started last week, Strapped, Finding Financial Freedom. Uh, as Norberto said we, uh, that last week that we started out talking about the rich story from Jesus' interaction with the rich young ruler, and he was really struggling to uh, just make Christ Lord, to, with, uh, to give everything to God. He, 
he was holding back, and it says that he went away sad. We know that he uh, was unwilling to surrender, and freedom comes. Financial freedom comes in surrender. Freedom comes just generally in uh, freedom comes in, in that surrender. There's another story that we find here in chapter 12 as we are building a foundation to, to find freedom, to be able to find financial freedom in our, in our lives. In this story in Luke chapter 12, let me give you a little background. Jesus has been teaching the, the crowds, the masses. It says in verse 1 of chapter 12 the, that thousands had, uh, had gathered, and, and, and he's teaching. And there are really some, if you look at that, the first 12 verses of chapter of chapter 12, there are really some weighty things that he's teaching about, some important subjects that he's teaching on. And then all of a sudden, in the midst of that, this guy interrupts Jesus and asks a question that's absolutely, totally unrelated to what he's teaching about, what he's, what he's been talking to the crowd about. It reminds, reminds me of back, I was a youth pastor for about a decade, and it reminds me of, of, of those times when you would just be teaching your heart out and, and, and you'd, you'd share something that you know that if the young people would get a hold of this concept, they could radically change their lives. And you open it up for comments. What, what, do, you, what do you mean I think about what we just talked about? And then some goofball young person starts asking a question totally unrelated to what I had just shared. Again, they, their lives could have been transformed, but instead they're off in la-la land thinking about something else, asking something totally unrelated, getting the whole class off on this tangent. And that's what this guy does to Jesus. He's really important, weighty subjects. And then out of left field, this is what this guy says. Someone in the crowd said to him, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. <laughs> totally unrelated to what he's talking about. Tell my brother to give me some of the money is what he's asking. Now, rabbis could, in their culture, could uh, get engaged in stuff like this. They could mediate, you know, these kind of questions. But notice the guy is not asking Jesus to, hey, can you sit down with my brother and I? Can you hear all the facts? Can you hear all the, uh, of what's going on? And then can you make a determination based on everything that's going on? That's not what he says. What he says is, Jesus, I want you to tell my brother to give me more stuff. That's the question, or not even a question, that's the, the statement. Tell my brother. So he probably was the younger brother, and in their culture, the younger brother would have got one share, the older brother would have gotten two shares. And so he's saying, I want you to change the, the protocol. I want you to tell my brother to give me more. And what does Jesus say? In verse 14, he says to him, man who made me a judge or an arbiter over you. Jesus doesn't want to get in, involved in the in the personal family disagreement. And again, I think back to last week with a rich young ruler. That he's, he's talking and he's, he's, he's interacting with Jesus, but Jesus sees something unhealthy going on in him. Jesus sees his heart and sees something else deeper than what he's talking about going on. And the struggle that, that Jesus saw in that guy, there's another struggle going on with this guy, and Jesus sees it. It's the same struggle that that, that we can have over money and stuff. The struggle that our culture has. The struggle that we can have. And so Jesus says to him in verse 15, Well, take care, be on your guard against all covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possession, possessions. So Jesus, notice, is not just talking to this guy. He doesn't just, you know... Uh, you just focus on this one, one guy and he have this private little interaction. Notice he says, Jesus, in verse 15, Jesus said to them. Jesus knows that, that even though this is tangential to what he's teaching about, that it's related to what's going on in the hearts of many people that are there. And he knows that it's going on in, the heart, in our hearts as well. So it's not just for them, it's for us what he's saying. Because we can struggle with it. This heart issue of covetousness, or an uh, easier word that we use more than coveting, is this word greed. And some of your translations use the word greed. That he's talking about greed. This guy, this guy didn't want Jesus just to mediate the, the issue so that it would produce a result that was right by him and his brother. He wanted more stuff for himself. Jesus saw through the question 
through the statement, and he sees the greed in his heart. And Jesus calls him out. He calls him out and he says, for one's life, Jesus says, does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. The NLT version says, life is not measured by how much you own. The message translation says it this way, life is not defined by what you have, even when you have a lot. And then Jesus tells a story. Jesus loved to tell stories. We think in stories, we dream in stories, we learn in stories. And so Jesus tells, him, tells them Notice again this parable. The land of a rich man produces, produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I'll do this. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I'll store all my grain and my goods. And I'll say to my soul, soul, you have more. You have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. And Jesus said to him, and God said to him, fool, This night your soul is required of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. So Jesus tells a story. Let's look at that story. Let's let's think about what Jesus is, is teaching them, teaching us in the story. He says there's this rich guy, and he has a bumper crop. Notice, and we will throw it up there, that, that, that text, and notice just... If you or you're looking at it, you could circle how many times he uses the word I. If I counted correctly, there are like 11 different times where he uses this guy in the story that Jesus is telling the story to this other guy. He says, I, uh, uh, my harvest, my crops, my barns, my grain, my goods, my soul, mine, mine, mine. I worked really hard for this, and so I'm going to do something so I can have even more stuff for myself. It's my stuff. And the first thing as we think about how can we have freedom, freedom, financial freedom, how can we have freedom in our lives? We find freedom when we understand ownership. We've got a number across our, our, our campuses, we've got a number of farmers, growers in our church family. Farmers that have Tremendous experience, amazing knowledge, some that that have advanced degrees in the science of agriculture. Farmers who really, really know what they're doing. And at the end of the day, they understand that they don't have ultimate control. You don't control the sun, you don't control the rain, you don't control storms, you don't control temperature variations. We're, We're enjoying that this weekend, right? Okay. I went to bed, I thought, oh, I, I plowed my driveway, I'm going to be good for in the morning, and then I wake up and kabam, where did all the snow come from? I mean, we, 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 don't have, we don't have any control. And how many times here in Southwest Michigan has, 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 has there been, you know, the, the crops are doing good, the buds the, in the spring, the, the buds start coming out, and then there's some hard frost and everything's destroyed. You can't really do anything about that as a, as a farmer, as a grower. Crops are ruined when there's too much rain or too little rain, when it doesn't come at the right time, when it comes at the wrong time. And again, what does the wealthy farmer say? He takes all the credit. But what does Jesus say in the story? The land, verse 16, the land of a rich man produced plentifully. Not the rich man produced, but the land of the rich man produced. And so in other words, God produced, that God made it happen. That the stuff that he has, God made possible. And it doesn't, you know, absolutely, it doesn't mean that the guy didn't work hard. He obviously was a hard worker. He obviously, uh, his workers worked hard. Uh, The people that he had working for him, I'm I'm sure, worked hard. He was a good business person. He he was a good builder. He was a good leader. All those things. But he still had this mindset of mine. I have because of me. My, my, mine. And freedom comes when we understand that we are not the owners, we're the stewards. Freedom comes when we understand ownership. Now, something I've shared before, but just do a little test. If you've got kids, tell your kids that we're going to go out, kids, and we're going to get a new gaming console. 
Whatever that is, whatever you don't have, just imagine taking them and whether it's a Switch or an Xbox or a PS5 or whatever, and you're going to go to the store. And so you load them up and you, and you drive in the car and you go to the store and you pick something out and you take it up to the counter and you whip your credit card out and you, and you buy the thing and then you get it home and you hook it up to your television and you plug it in and, and you let them play for an hour or two. And then you walk back into the room where your little human is there playing the game and you say, okay, uh, it's my turn. And what does the little human, more often than not, say something along the lines of, no, it's mine. Even though you loaded them up in your car, you left from your house and went to the store where you put the gaming console on the counter and pulled out your credit card and paid for it with your car and then got the little human back into your car and drove them home with your gas in your driveway, hooked it up to your TV, plugged it into the power outlet that you paid the electric bill for and you gave the controller to them and they played it and then they say, mine? How crazy is that? And that's exactly how crazy it is when we say to God the same thing. That it's mine. When we don't understand ownership. This guy didn't understand ownership. Go back to the text. And I'll say to you, I'll say to my soul. Soul. And so he, it's like he's in control of his soul too. This, the deepest part of who he is. He says, my soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. So the guy tears down his barns. He builds bigger barns. He fills those bigger barns up with more grain and more goods and more stuff. All my, my, mine. And then after that, he says to his soul, my soul, soul. I love the way he talks to himself. Soul. Now, after we get all the things, now at some future point, and I've outlined when that future point's going to be, I'm going to be, then we're going to be satisfied, and then we're going to have enough, and then, then, our soul's going to be satisfied, and we're going to eat, and we're going to drink, and we're going to be merry. Freedom is found when I understand what satisfies my soul. And stuff. He, he, he thought falsely that, that having more stuff, and there's going to be this point, and, and at some point I'm going to be satisfied, and I'll have enough, I'll have enough barns, and I'll have enough stuff in my barns, that then I'm going to be, sit out, be able to sit out and to eat, drink, and be merry for many years. And it really doesn't matter how much stuff I have, that I can falsely think that there comes a point then. Then I'll be satisfied. Then, and it's all determined by something, by attaining something, by gaining something, by, by buying something or having something. And so when I have nothing, and I said last week, the Christian and I, we were first married, we didn't have two nickels drove together. And so that idea that, well, when we have two nickels, when we, we have that and we, we, we can actually buy our own house or maybe we can, or whatever it is, whatever that point is, then I'll be satisfied. And so if you have nothing, you can think there is a point. Then I'll be satisfied. And when you have a lot of things and you think, well, when I get that paid off or I have this or, or that thing or whatever it is at some future point when I'm secure, when I'm safe, when I know that I've got enough, no matter what happens, that I've, I say to my soul, soul, then there'll be this point. And it's all about more. When I have more, 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 more. And freedom is, under, is, un, is found by understanding what satisfies our soul. And what satisfies my soul is not more. More will never satisfy the soul like this guy thought. It's interesting what Bob Marley said. He said, some people are so poor, all they have is money. Some people are so poor that all they have is money. And as I said before, the illustration that, that, that it's that, that, that idea, that whirlwind of, of more and things and attaining, it's like it's in possessions, it's like drinking salt water that you, that you want it and you have the desire for it and you're thirsty and you drink the salt water and then it makes you even more thirsty and you drink more salt water and more and more and more until it will finally kill you, this desire for more. And what does Jesus warn in verse 15? For one's life doesn't consist in the abundance 
of possessions. Verse 19 again. Let me read it. And I'll say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul is required of you. And the things you've prepared, whose will they be? So to this point in the story, he's been talking to himself. Jesus is telling this, this parable, and, and this whole time, this, this wealthy, rich farmer guy has been leaving God out. And for, for the first time, you now have God entering the conversation, and God addresses him, and he says, you fool. How many different times do we hear God or Jesus talk? Maybe when God says of Jesus the Son, he says, this is my Son whom I'm, I'm well pleased. What a, what a beautiful line. What a beautiful statement. That idea that we will stand before God one day. And what we will hear from our Savior, well done, my good and faithful servant. What powerful words that we will one day hear as we stand before God. That, that, that term, dear child, you know, these, these beautiful interactions that we see in Scripture where God, where Jesus, where, 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 where there's some, some verbiage towards someone, some, some address that's giving, some sentence giving, given towards someone, and yet what's the word given? What's the description? What's the, what's the title? You fool. How tragic to live our lives. And what God might say of us, you fool. Now, when he, that, the implication of that is not he's a fool because he doesn't know something. It's not that he's, he's, he's a fool because um, he, he doesn't know enough facts or doesn't know enough things. You know, obviously, as we said, he's successful, he's, he's powerful, he, he, he knows how to do things, he knows how to plant things, he knows how to grow things, he knows he's a good business person, he's a good leader, all those things. So it's not what he doesn't know. Chris and I were watching this game show uh, this week, uh, The Floor. I don't know if you've ever seen it. And I was surprised at how little some people who are on a trivia game show know about things. But it's not about what he doesn't know. It's about his heart. He's a fool because of what he's believing about how he's living. He's a fool because he has a, he has a wrong philosophy or idea about life. And that life is only about taking care of number one. He had this, pre, this selfish preoccupation with stuff and gaining more stuff. And a safer environment, uh, uh, you know, is going to be had for him in the future when he has more of the things. But you know what a better investment would have been than barns and bigger barns for more stuff? A better investment might have been for him to have invested and put his extra food in the bellies of people that had nothing. That would have been a better investment. But he was a fool because he thought that he was in control. And freedom is found by accepting how much I don't control. When I understand that, I, that I'm not in control, like the, the farmer that understands, you know what, I, I can't control the rain or the, the, the soil, the, 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 the stuff, the, the sun. I can't control those things. I'm going to do what I can, but I'm going to trust God. And, and, and what does God say in the story? What happens? Your soul will be required of you. He thought that he could control his future and that when I get to this point, I'll, I'll find soul satisfaction, but he, he acted like he was in control, but he really wasn't in control. And we can find freedom when we finally understand that we are not in control. James 4, 13, come now. You who say today or tomorrow will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade to make profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What's your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say... If the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. And friends, there is freedom in understanding and accepting that we are not in control. That my life is a mist. I'm going I'm to live for a time. I'm going to be here for a bit. And then I'm gone in advance. We were in the men's Bible study Wednesday night. We were sitting around tables. And we were looking at uh, Hebrews chapter 1. And we were talking in Hebrews chapter 1. In that first line of Hebrews chapter 1, it says, In these last days... And we were talking about how as men we need to live with a sense of urgency that we don't know how long we have, but until the time that we're called home, that we want to live with urgency. That I want to make a difference until that time 
that God calls me home, that I don't control today. And I live like a fool when I live like I have control of everything. I live like a fool when I think that if I just build bigger barns and have more stuff and, and, I, and I attain and I, and I gain, that that's what will satisfy my soul. And what is the guy in the story? What does God say to the guy in the story? You fool, tonight your soul will be required and all of your stuff, God basically says, and all of your stuff will be set out on Tab- uh, on, uh, on card tables in your driveway and people will be haggling over it for pennies on the dollar. That's the future. That's the future for all of us. Unless the Lord comes back. All the stuff that we thought was so important, we're not taking it with us. We don't have control. And then there's one final thing I want to make sure we get in the story. Look at verse 21. And so is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. That's the summary. He had produced a bumper crop and he thought, well, if I, you know, the purpose, I'm just going to build bigger barns and bigger barns. I'm going to keep my stuff. And then once I get more of the stuff, then I can live a life of ease. I can live many years, eat, drink, be merry. And it's all about me. And my life is characterized by investing in myself when that's not what life is about. Life is about God told us and he's told us throughout scripture that he blesses us so that we have the privilege of being a blessing to others. That we have a privilege as he blesses us, that we have a privilege to build the kingdom together. It's, I love the story of, of what God has enabled us as a church to be able to do and to help and come alongside people in Paraguay and Malawi and Lebanon and around the world. Because we understand this. We understand that freedom, I think it's what Jesus is teaching us, freedom is found when we root our riches in God. We said last week, there's nothing wrong with being rich. We see in Scripture, nothing wrong with, being, with having things. We see in scripture, scripture that God used people that he had blessed, blessed, who in turn understood that and were willing to be a blessing to others. It's how we view that blessing. It's how we view what we have. It's how we view, am I a steward? Do I, do I get that? Is it all about me? Or have I found freedom that it's not about me, that it's about I have been blessed so that I can be a blessing, so my, I've rooted, I'm rooted in something different, that I'm rich toward God. I'm rich toward God, not myself. And what does Paul write to young Timothy about finding contentment in this world, of, of, of rooting my riches in something beyond myself, that there's contentment in that. But godliness, 1 Timothy 6, 6, but godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world and we cannot take anything out of it. But if we have food and clothing with these, we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves themselves with many pangs. Money is not the root of evil. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And the problem is when we make my I make my life about just what I can get, and I talk to myself, and it's my soul, and if I get more, and I get to this point, and I tear those barns down, I have bigger barns, and then maybe at some point I'll be able to live a long time. When I have this car, or that gadget, or I find love in that relationship, or I have this perfect job, or I attain this level at, at, at work, the false notion that there's something that this world has to offer that unlocks the secret to contentment. With the things of this, from the things of this world. But it turns out all the stuff and all the little bobbles and pretty little things that we're not taking with us, that's not where we find contentment. That's not what it's about. The fool thinks that's what it's about. I saw this this week. I wanted to share it with you. I heard someone say it. It's not what we have that's the issue. The issue is what we do with what we have and how much we have has us what I do with what I have and what I have how much I have has me friends how is God speaking to you I'm going to invite our worship team to come back up Jesus could see in the heart of the rich young ruler last week that there was something deeper going on and he was unwilling to surrender and Jesus sees into our heart today 
And he sees at times that we have this proclivity to be gripped with greed. Gripped by the things of this world to falsely come to the conclusion that if I just have more and I get to this point, then I'll find satisfaction when satisfaction in this life has nothing to do with those things. So in the final moments today, as we prepare to sing and worship and listen to the Lord, what does Jesus see in your heart? That's between you and him. I don't know. What does Jesus see in your heart? What does Jesus see in you that no one else sees? What would he say to you today? What's he challenging you today with? Is your heart in bondage to maybe some sin or some greed or something? Today is a day to find freedom. If you've never invited Christ to be your Savior, I'm going to pray for you in a moment. I would encourage you to start there, to find freedom in Christ. If you've you've been following Christ for some time and and you're here today, maybe, maybe today God's speaking to you about something that has kind of grabbed hold of your heart. And today, what he's asking you to do is just to let go. To let go of the stuff, let go of the desire for more. And just trust him and give him control. Certainly, Father, I don't know how you want to speak to us today. But I know you're here and I know you see what's really going on in us. And so, Father, whether it's coming to you for the first time and admitting our sin in our lives and recognizing that we need a Savior... God, I thank you that you forgive us as we come to you and as we ask. We can receive the salvation that comes through the person of your son, Jesus Christ. I thank you for that today. I thank you, God, that that as you are shaping us into the image of Christ, that we're on this journey after we make that decision, we're on this journey to become more and more like your son. And and God, there are things along that way, along that journey that that you bring up, just like out of the blue, uh, talking about other things, and all of a sudden, and God, maybe we came in and just out of the blue today all of a sudden we recognize that there's something going on that we need to confess to you today and so father we let go of whatever it is and we thank you god that you forgive us and that you god want to help us to not be in bondage to the stuff of this world but to find freedom i pray that you would pour out freedom in this place and we pray in jesus name